New stakeholders essentially are introduced into the document, uh, particularly those uh, for the patient themselves, uh, pharmacists and uh, primary health care uh, physicians. Uh, so the uh, effects of chronic rhinitis on ascites, um, uh, present a large burden of disease. Um, when you're looking at the general population, uh, it affects about up to 12%. Um, and those patients with uh, nasal polyps uh, account for about 2% um, of that. Uh, this results in a huge uh, amount of cost. Uh, and the first really looking at the direct medical costs um, in the US uh, alone, um, up to 13 billion per year, or um, uh, $2,600 per patient per year. And in Europe, um, about 2,500 euros per patient uh, per year. Um, surgery um, is also a costly, although um, the costs are varied uh, with $1,100 in India per patient. Uh, compared to $11,000 um, in the USA. However, uh, studies have shown that surgery actually is cost saving, particularly um, two years uh, post surgery. Um, there's also a, a huge indirect cost um, of chronic rhinitis and ascites, uh, and it results in, uh, from absenteeism or presenteeism um, with an overall cost of about $20 billion per year. And so to put it into perspective, chronic rhinosinusitis uh, is more costly um, than asthma, hay fever, and uh, peptic ulcer disease uh, combined. And so the um, traditional um, uh, um, take on the pathophysiology of chronic rhinosinusitis really had uh, um, little relevance uh, to the clinician treating and managing these patients. And uh, the historical thinking um, and the old classification essentially was that uh, chronic rhinosinusitis was essentially subdivided into two groups, those patients with polyps and those without polyps. And the old presumption was that patients with polyps um, had an allergy, um, either local or systemic. And so the treatment uh, was focused really on uh, corticosteroids. And uh, those patients without polyps it was thought um, that it was a result of a, a chronic bacterial infection, uh, which was poorly treated in the acute setting, persisted, and uh, therefore uh, patients were given antibiotics. And um, if patients failed that, that treatment, surgery really was the only option uh, for treatment failure. Uh, but um, with all the new research coming in the last 10 years, we know that um, thinking about uh, chronic rhinosinusitis in this way um, is essentially um, um, really simple and um, um, misses out really on the huge number of phenotypes that are in fact present. And uh, we know that um, uh, patients who um, were previously classified as patients without nasal polyps in actual fact um, had um, uh, evidence of a polypoidal mucosa um, or polyps within the, uh, the sinus cavities themselves and not necessarily presenting within the nasal cavity. So um, this view of chronic sinusitis is essentially limited. And that's why um, there are uh, new proposed um, guidelines. Um, uh, in, in that time, um, what uh, researchers uh, try to do is actually focus treatment on the etiology of chronic rhinosinusitis. So there's a huge number of, um, of research uh, going into essentially um, uh, fungal causes for chronic rhinosinusitis, but we now know that that is disproven and perhaps uh, you know, uh, entities like allergic um, fungal rhinosinusitis, essentially misnomers and are not caused uh, by, by fungi. fungi. Um, there was a large uh, group of work done on Staphylococcus and Staphylococcus uh, superantigens. Um, um, and uh, the work done by Wormold in Australia on uh, biofilms, and more recently, a microbial dysbiosis. Um, but essentially, um, these um, have uh, proven to be ineffective, and uh, tr trying to treat these causes um, has largely been unsuccessful. And so um, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of research on inflammatory pathways and host immune systems. And now we have finally a contemporary model 
for the pathophysiology of chronic rhinosinusitis. And this diagram is taken uh, from the EPOS 2020 guidelines. And essentially, um, uh, just to understand uh, basically what happens, is that we now know that the sinuses are not sterile and are in fact colonized um, at birth by various um, pathogens and, uh, and viruses. And um, there's an interaction between your mucosa in the paranasal sinuses um, on your, of your host immune system uh, with the external environment and a balance is played out. At some point um, in the development of, the, of the, the disease, the mucosa barrier is penetrated um, uh, from various uh, causes and uh, it results in a type of inflammatory uh, cascade. And that's what we talk about really is the endotype or the type of inflammation um, that occurs. So in a normal individual, when the barrier is penetrated from a, a, a pathogen, essentially um, inflammation um, is started, but then is controlled and the patient returns to baseline. But what happens in a patient with chronic rhinosinusitis is that this barrier is penetrated and the type of inflammation is perpetuated and becomes chronic. And there are different types of infl inflammatory pathways which we'll discuss. And this chronic inflammation then results in uh, tissue remodeling, um, which results in the phenotype or um, clinically what we see, uh, for example, patients with nasal polyps or allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. And we know that this chronic inflammation um, also um, uh, is associated with lower airway disease. And there's a lot of work done to show that um, the, the nose um, and the lungs essentially form part of um, um, essentially the same system or, or the, the airway as such. Um, and, and so um, before the endotype, um, uh, researchers were trying to essentially focus treatment on the host immune system, uh, looking at genetic and epigenetic factors, um, but, uh, as well as various environmental triggers. Uh, but this approach essentially is impractical due to the uh, vast heterogeneity um, of the field. And, and to, to simplify things, um, we now focus on the endotype or the type of inflammation, which really influences your medical treatment as well as surgical treatment, which we'll come to. So if you look at, this is a picture depicting um, an epithelial layer of sinus mucosa. Um, it is penetrated uh, by various pathogens, and then you result in different types of inflammation. Um, uh, there, are more, there are more than three types, but these are the ones mostly described, and they can occur in isolation or as a, a mixture, which, which complicates things. Um, but if you're looking at uh, type um, two, which is the main focus um, really in the chronic rhinosinusitis research, um, this inflammatory pathway occurs in 80% of the Western world, which results in um, stimulation of cytokines, interleukin-4 and interleukin-5, with a local IgE production and a predominant eosinophilia. Um, type 1 results more in a overall neutrophilia, and type 3 in a B-cell activation. Um, but essentially, uh, we know that... Um, uh, this type of inflammation really results in tissue remodeling, and this gives you the phenotypes of uh, polyp formation, goblet cell hyperplasia, and epithelial dysfunction. And we know that uh, type 2 inflammation really uh, uh, results in uh, resistant cases to therapy, um, have a high recurrence rate, and uh, are associated with more tissue remodeling. And uh, type 2 inf inf inflammation, and these targets really have um, allowed for the development of various immunotherapies, which we will discuss. So how do you identify these patients? Well, uh, type 2 inf inflammation, uh, these patients generally uh, will complain more a of anosmia um, or nasal blockage, and they are more likely to have um, the non-steroidal um, exacerbated respiratory disease or uh, old terminology symptoms triad, more likely to have asthma and atopy. Um, on nasal endoscopy, they're more likely to have polyps or polypoidal mucosa and will have eosinophilic mucin. Uh, 
and uh, if you test uh, in the lab, they're likely to have an elevated total IgE um, and eosinophilia for, uh, from either mucus or biopsy um, of the polyps. Um, eosinophilia really defined as more than 10 eosinophils per high power field. Um, and what about the non-type 2? Uh, these patients generally uh, will present more with uh, nasal discharge or um, post-nasal drip, uh, facial pain or pressure symptoms, and, and they're less likely to have asthma or, or ATOP. Um, on nasal endoscopy, they're more likely to have a paralance, and uh, laboratory tests show normal IgE, and there's no evidence um, of eosinophilia. And so the, um, the new classification of chronic rhinitis essentially essentially has broken it up down into either primary or secondary chronic rhinitis oncitis. So primary um, meaning that there is a innate pathology of the, chronic, uh, of the paranasal sinuses. Um, and secondary, um, there is an underlying pathology, uh, for example, cystic fibrosis or um, primary ciliary dyskinesia with a um, resultant um, chronic rhinosinusitis. Um, this helps to essentially break out the different phenotypes. Um, and both the primary and secondary are further subdivided into anatomical location. So if you look at uh, primary, uh, it's either localized um, and which is predominantly unilateral. So localized, what that means um, essentially are um, in inflammation of uh, essentially contiguous uh, sinus cavities that uh, form part of a functional unit. For example, um, in this case, this is a patient uh, CT scan depicting allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, and you can see there's a pacification of the, the frontal sinus and the uh, maxillary sinus, um, and this all drains uh, via the ostomiatal complex. So it's functionally anatomically related. Um, so that's what, what, what is meant by localized, and, and, and it's predominantly unilateral. If you're looking at diffuse uh, subset, uh, diffuse doesn't necessarily mean uh, pan sinusitis or, or white out of the sinuses, um, um, but often uh, essentially it means that it's anatomically, maybe anatomically unrelated, um, and is usually bilateral. So if you're looking at uh, some examples, uh, on the left, you've got a CT scan of a patient with chronic rhinitis sinusitis with nasal polyps, um, where there's uh, essentially um, uh, mucosal thickening and um, uh, evidence of sinusitis. And on the right, uh, looking at a patient um, with um, cystic fibrosis and, and nasal, uh, nasal polyposis. So this essentially um, is examples of diffuse bilateral disease. So if you look in more detail, the uh, primary chronic rhinosinusitis, if you're looking at the localized uh, causes, uh, it's further subdivided according to the endotype as type 2 or non-type 2. So if you remember type 2 um, with the predominant eosinophilia, um, if it's localized, an example is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. Um, and uh, if it's non-type 2, this would be um, an isolated sinusitis, which implies really um, that there might be an underlying anatomical um, abnormality. And uh, both these uh, groups essentially are more likely to have surgery early on. And, and we know that um, surgery um, essentially is, is the main of treatment for allergic fungal on the sinusitis. Um, and isolated sinusitis is removing the anatomical obstruction. Uh, the diffuse uh, category is also uh, subdivided into type 2 or non-type 2. And in your uh, examples of your type 2 inflammation, um, you've got your central compartment um, atopic disease, um, which is essentially uh, patients who have an inhalant allergy and uh, have a disease within the central compartment of the nose. Essentially, the, they have polypoidal mucosa um, and not necessarily um, polyps. Um, and then it also includes your eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis or chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. And of course, you, uh, we, you know that the um, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis can be bilateral in some cases or diffuse. And non-type 2 are uh, non-eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis, essentially um, with uh, low eosinophils. And these patients essentially are more refractory um, to standard uh, medical therapy. So that's primary chronic rhinosinusitis. And when you look at um, 
secondary uh, chronic ulnar sinusitis um, is also um, classified as a localized or diffuse. Um, in the localized category, um, these phenotypes include uh, fungal ball, uh, for example, uh, tumors, uh, for example, inverting papilloma that results in a secondary chronic ulnar sinusitis, or maybe odontogenic um, in nature. Um, and the diffuse uh, category is subdivided um, according to the mechanism or endotype here. If it's mechanical, it's usually, uh, for example, cystic fibrosis or primary cellular dyskinesia um, resulting in um, chronic ulnar sinusitis. And, and these patients particularly have polyps. Um, and uh, they require um, more extensive um, surgery. Um, the inflammatory group, uh, you're looking at um, granulomatous polyangitis or, or, or uh, Wegener's, um, as well as Schurich Strauss. So Schurich Strauss, uh, these are uh, um, patients who develop late onset asthma and nasal polyposis. And uh, the rare subcategory of uh, primary immunodeficiencies, which may result um, in chronic ulnar sinusitis. Um, so, so you can see uh, from this uh, classification that. There's a huge variation of phenotypes, um, and the old classification essentially um, misses out on these. And, and, and this really gives you the opportunity to um, really um, uh, have a good differential diagnosis. As an ENT, uh, most commonly you're going to see um, or be treating primary chronic ulnar sinusitis um, with secondary, um, a more, rare, more rare event. So, um, in summary, the uh, management of chronic ulnar sinusitis. Uh, we now talk about appropriate uh, medical therapy, which has always been the first line um, of treatment. And um, we have, uh, that is also dependent on type 2 and non-type 2 inflammation. The um, mainstay of treatment are nasal steroids and saline rinses. Um, if you have type 2 predominant inflammation, you may want to consider short courses of oral corticosteroids. Um, EPOS recommends, um, you know, two a year. Um, and if it's non-type 2, you, may, you might want to consider long-term antibiotics. So essentially, um, if patients have failed appropriate medical therapy, they are candidates for endoscopic sinus surgery. And um, after endoscopic sinus surgery, um, appropriate medical therapy is continued and is mandatory. The duration of treatment is 8 to 12 weeks. Um, if patients um, fail um, after endoscopic sinus surgery and appropriate medical therapy, we now have essentially additional therapies to add, and that's really based on uh, the type of inflammation. If you have a type 2 inflammation, um, the options are um, aspirin treatment after aspirin desensitization, particularly in non steroidal exacerbated respiratory disease. Um, they might uh, undergo revision surgery. And of course, there are um, the biologics, which are new options. And uh, in non-type 2 infl inflammation, essentially the options are either revision surgery or long-term antibiotics. And there has been some research um, into xylitol rinses, which have been shown to be effective. Um, so uh, just uh, recapping um, the evidence uh, for effective treatments, um, we know that um, saline uh, works and uh, uh, either a nasal irrigation with isotonic saline or ringers lactate has efficacy in chronic ulnar sinusitis. Uh, there are more than 30 randomized control trials and it's shown to improve clinical symptoms, quality of life, and uh, various um, endoscopic and radiological scores. Um, larger volumes of saline are more effective compared to uh, nasal sprays and no uh, delivery method um, has shown to be superior. The additions of xylitol have a positive effect, particularly in non-type 2 inflammation. And um, the uh, use of uh, substances like baby shampoo or hypertonic saline are not recommended uh, due to the low evidence and uh, side effect profile. Uh, intranasal corticosteroids um, have been shown to be effective and safe for patients in chronic ulnar sinusitis with very limited systemic absorption and no increased uh, risk of um, ocular side effects. Uh, they have a positive impact on quality of life and nasal symptoms, and the effect on symptoms is uh, seen more in patients with nasal polyps. Um, a meta-analysis done showed that there was no difference between the different types of steroids um, used, and um, 
if you give uh, intranasal corticosteroids post-operatively, it has sh been shown to prevent uh, polyp recurrence. Uh, if you look at this study um, conducted um, in, in Sydney, Raymond Sachs and, and Richard Harvey, um, looking at sinus surgery and delivery methods and how it influences the effectiveness of topical corticosteroids for chronic renal sinusitis and meta-analysis, they essentially looked at a systematic review of randomized control trials comparing intranasal corticosteroids to placebo, as well as uh, various um, delivery methods, um, looking at about 48 studies and close to 4,000 patients. And overall, uh, steroid intranasal corticosteroids improved overall symptoms, which is statistically significant. It decreased polyp size and prevented polyp recurrence, and particularly uh, in post-surgical patients. And direct sinus delivery methods um, uh, have proved really to be uh, better for symptom control. And uh, in conclusion, um, uh, prior surgery and direct sinus delivery method for example, uh, budesonide uh, rinses uh, compared to nasal spray really enhance the effectiveness of intranasal corticosteroids. And uh, this basically um, shows that steroids are not only effective, but uh, surgery plays an important role to create a cavity for access uh, for medication. And the more uh, uh, perhaps a penetration you can get with the steroid, the more um, effective um, it can be. There's been a lot of uh, work, particularly um, in the US, on eluting stents and various drug delivery methods. Um, and um, particularly here, um, looking at corticosteroid eluting implants in patients who have had endoscopic sinus surgery have been shown to be effective uh, when placed in the region of the ethmoid. Um, they've had a significant improvement in nasal obstruction, although a small effect. And there's a significant a reduction in the need uh, for revision surgery. Um, EPOS um, considers it as a, a viable option. However, there are various drawbacks. It's extremely high cost. Um, the criticism um, is that there are no long-term studies and there's no randomized control trial comparing a stent versus um, short courses of oral corticosteroids. Um, this is a, a, a randomized control trial um, uh, um, published in 2016 looking at um, drug eluting uh, stents in office treatment for recurrent sinus polyposis after surgery and looking at six month outcomes. And they had 100 patients uh, with uh, polyps who had failed medical therapy and who had had surgery and were now candidates for um, endoscopic sinus surgery. And the two arms were either a corticosteroid stent or a sham procedure. They looked at three month post endoscopic grading and showed a significant reduction in nasal blockage and polyp grade. And uh, the control group was 3.6 times uh, more likely to continue um, to have revision surgery. Um, so showing promise, although um, there are uh, limitations. Um, short courses of systemic corticosteroids result in significant reduction in the total symptom and nasal polyp score um, in patients with polyps. Um, there are seven uh, double-blinded randomized controlled trials looking at uh, comparing oral corticosteroids to placebo and they've shown to be effective um, but only for a short duration and after three months they don't have any effect on symptoms. So EPOS recommends um, this is an adjunct um, one to two courses of uh, corticosteroids per year in patients um, who are partially or, or uncontrolled. Um, the requirement of more courses really uh, defines a patient as difficult to treat chronic rhinus sinusitis. Um, in the post-operative period, there's no benefit uh, to give a patient a short course of corticos oral corticosteroids um, post endoscopic sinus surgery. And of course, um, there is um, the side effect profile to consider. Um, antibiotics um, have always been contentious and, and EPOS has defined the uh, duration of antibiotics um, into either short term or long term. Uh, the short term antibiotics are essentially less than four weeks. In reality, a um, 10 day course. Um, this is used to treat either acute bacterial infection or an acute exacerbation of chronic chronic sinusitis. 
Um, but this should always be a culture directed and there is no recommendation for the routine use of antibiotics. We know that uh, from, the, from the literature that um, acute exacerbations of chronic groundless sinusitis are often not due to uh, bacteria as, as one's thought, but in actual fact, um, a flare up of um, acute infl inflammation. And so steroids perhaps work better in that situation. Um, in the long term, more than four weeks, and uh, here we're not using antibiotics for the antimicrobial properties, but rather for the immunomodulatory effects. And uh, this is um, um, essentially shows promise in non-type 2 inflammation. And um, there's been research done uh, in macrolides and um, doxycycline, which we'll discuss that now. So uh, the macrolides uh, both have anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects, and all this research really comes from um, uh, the treatment of pan bronchiolitis um, uh, in Japan, which showed um, uh, effectiveness for, for this condition. And however, um, in, in chronic chronic sinusitis, there's conflicting evidence in, in the literature. Um, so in 2006, war work uh, looked at uh, roxithromycin, and uh, they had a significant effect in patients without polyps and with low IgE levels. Um, however, uh, in 2011, um, uh, looking at a study with azithromycin, 500 milligrams once a week, um, had no significant um, effect. Um, we also know uh, from a meta-analysis by Hung et al. that not all macrolides are equal and that clarithromycin seems to be better than um, azithromycin. Um, the most benefit um, of macrolides are seen in patients with non-type 2 inflammation, i.e. Um, low eosinophilia. Um, but the benefit is time dependent. So the full effect really of a macrolide will only be seen at 12 weeks, um, at which you get a, about a 71% benefit. Um, there are, however, significant adverse events um, to consider. Um, there is a risk of uh, QT interval prolongation and uh, cardiac arrhythmia. Um, there's a concern of drug resistance and one should be, ca be cautious and take a cardiovascular history and consider an ECG prior to, prior to its use. Um, so um, with all of this, uh, EPOS essentially can't make the recommendation for the routine use of macrolides as long-term treatment, um, and there needs to be essentially larger randomized controlled trials um, with uh, placebo arm. If you look at um, the study which was published in the Netherlands, uh, looking at um, oral steroids and doxycycline to approaches to treat uh, nasal polyps, it was a double blinded randomized controlled trial um, with patients with bilateral nasal polyps. And since you had three groups, the one group uh, received oral uh, methylprednisolone, the other doxycycline 200 milligrams, followed by 100 milligrams for 20 days, and placebo arm and looked at 12 week follow up. And they show that doxycycline significantly decreased nasal polyp size, uh, but when you look at uh, the data, essentially it's only just, um, you know, with a p-value of 0.05. So doxycycline might be used uh, to treat uh, nasal polyps, uh, but essentially um, EPOS can't make the recommendation. There's been a lot of um, research into um, calcium channel blockers. Uh, for patients with the nasal polyps. And uh, so the hypothesis really is that um, in patients with polyps, there's an overexpression of an epithelial glycoprotein or PGP. And PGP stimulates type 2 inflammation and stimulating, therefore, interleukin 5 and 6. And so how verapamil essentially is a first generation calcium channel blocker, it inhibits um, this glycoprotein and indirectly reduces a type 2 inflammation. Um, there have been um, s some studies of this double-blinded placebo-controlled trial looking at verapamil uh, for chronic chronic sinusitis and nasal polyps. Um, essentially, the trial was stopped uh, due to patients having um, side effects, uh, but uh, what they got out of it was uh, essentially using verapamil um, 80 milligrams three times a day compared to placebo over eight weeks, and essentially they only managed to recruit 18 patients. 
and verapamil showed significant improvement in SNOP22 and lung case score. But essentially, the study was not adequately powered uh, to confirm efficacy, and uh, we know that uh, verapamil is, uh, or calcium channel blockers are actually contraindicated in congestive cardiac failure and AD block. Um, so when thinking about this, one needs to take cardiovascular history and, and perhaps do a, um, an ECG. And there's also the issue of the drawback of patient compliance um, to take um, a verapamil three times a day. And uh, essentially because of the lower level of evidence, EPOS advises against the use um, of uh, verapamil to treat nasal polyps. Um, so what about endoscopic sinus surgery? Um, uh, when to operate, and essentially it's indicated when appropriate medical therapy has failed. Um, and EPOS essentially has looked at a minimum trial of eight weeks of appropriate medical therapy, um, which includes a short course of uh, systemic corticosteroid or a short course of a culture directed antibiotic or prolonged course of low dose anti inflammatory antibiotic or with a post treatment uh, SNOT score of more than, um, SNOT 22 of more than 20. And we know that endoscopic sinus surgery has a high success rate, 89%, uh, which is higher than um, those of medical treatment. Um, we're looking at medical therapy versus surgery for chronic renal sinusitis. Uh, Smith et al. did a prospective multi-institutional study with a one-year follow-up, looking at three groups, uh, those patients uh, with uh, a medical therapy uh, uh, and uh, those undergoing surgical therapy and those crossing over from medical to surgical. And the surgical cohort had a significant improvement in the quality of life and the crossover group benefited more um, uh, after having surgery. And so what this study shows is that, in fact, patients, the earlier um, surgery is done, perhaps the, the better the outcomes. Uh, surgery is also um, cost effective. Um, if you look at Rudnick's uh, study on economic evaluation of endoscopic science surgery versus continued medical therapy. Um, it was found that surgery is the most cost-effective intervention compared to medical therapy for the long-term management and is really seen by the third year uh, post-optically. Um, surgery, um, interestingly, endotypes um, have the potential already to dictate the extent of surgery, what type of surgery you're going to do. Um, if you're looking at the non-type 2 um, uh, inflammation, low eosinophils here, we talk about functional endoscopic sinus surgery, or in other words, mucosal sparing. And the definition really is to create a sinus cavity that will incorporate an atrostium, it will facilitate ventilation and mucosillary clearance. Patients with moderate type 2 inflammation um, undergo endoscopic sinus surgery with removal um, of mucosa. And in patients with severe um, type 2 inflammation, we talk about rebooting endoscopic sinus surgery, and this is, um, incorporates a complete mucosa clearance and nasalization of sinuses, uh, for example, um, DRAF3 or Lothrop. And here you're looking at patients um, who perhaps have um, non-steroidal exacerbated respiratory disease um, or in all terminology symptoms who perhaps require more um, extensive surgery um, to have a benefit and to decrease recurrence. And so the work on uh, biologics, uh, looking at the type 2 inflammatory pathway, um, has uh, essentially opened up the door for um, monoclonal antibodies. Um, and uh, you can see on, on the right, you've got um, uh, dupilumab, which uh, is an anti-interleukin-4 alpha. Um, you've got omelizumab as uh, anti-IgE, and you've got mepolizumab uh, targeted against interleukin-5, um, all trying essentially to decrease the eosinophilic load or burden in, in, in the sinuses. Um, so the, um, essentially the trials really um, uh, were uh, in conjunction with patients with severe asthma. If you look at here, omelizumab using to tr uh, treat nasal pods and asthma together, um, severe uh, allergic asthma patients with nasal polyps, um, they compared omelizumab versus surgery, but really found that at 16 weeks, um, patients who had undergone surgery had uh, equal outcomes essentially to those patients who had um, omelizumab. Um, and due to this, uh, EPOS at this time can't make the recommendation for the use of omelizumab. 
uh, mepolizumab um, showed some promise, uh, particularly um, looking at anti interleukin 5. And uh, patients with chronic rhinosinusitis sinusitis and nasal polyps, um, they had uh, 20 patients versus placebo. And the greatest effect was seen um, at four weeks post treatment. However, um, over time, uh, by 16 weeks, um, these patients returned to baseline. And uh, therefore, EPOS uh, cannot make recommendation for mepolizumab. Um, perhaps the only monoclonal antibody that has uh, can be recommended is uh, dipilumab. Um, and the study looking at the essentially two trials looking at the efficacy in patients with severe chronic sinusitis and nasal polyps uh, with or without uh, non steroid anti inflammatory um, drug exacerbated respiratory disease. It is the only FDA approved monoclonal antibody for patients with nasal polyposis and sh has shown a significant improvement in SNOT22 and London case score and is a significant reduction to revision surgery of 73%. And EPOS recommends it um, where indicated. Um, and uh, because these drugs essentially um, are, are so expensive, um, the uh, and also um, you know the the use is limited. Um, EPOS has essentially come up with um, strict uh, indications for biologics, and a patient essentially have had to have had uh, endoscopic sinus surgery previously. Um, have, have to have bilateral polyps and need three of the criteria. And the criteria include evidence of type 2 inflammation, which are tissue eosinophilia of more than 10 per high power field, or blood eosinophils of more than 250, or a total IgE of more than 100. Uh, the need for systemic corticosteroids or contraindication to systemic steroids, um, a significant um, impairment of quality of life, um, anosmia, and diagnosis of comorbid asthma. Um, but essentially, um, it, not, uh, biologics don't work um, in all patients and are essentially discontinued if there's no response. The, uh, the drawbacks are, are the extremely high costs. Um, uh, you know, biologics on average uh, costs uh, anywhere between seventeen dollars to $20,000 per patient per year. Um, uh, the problem with them is that uh, there's no evidence of cure, and it's unknown uh, the, uh, the appropriate duration of, of treatment and whether patients um, go into remission or need top-up. Um, it's also not known whether um, the use of biologics um, can uh, avoid surgery um, altogether. Um, and that's good news if you uh, want to be a rhinologist because you'll still have a job. Um, and essentially, biologics uh, target type 2 inflammatory pathways, um, but we know that type 2 infl inflammation in the eosinophilia occurs 80% in the Western population, but what about other population groups? We know that in the East, um, in Japan, type 2 inflammation results in a neutrophilia. So um, biologics are, are not going to work there. Um, so really, uh, in summary, biologics are only justifiable um, in patients who have severe uncontrolled asthma um, and perhaps have um, nasal polyposis. Um, so what about um, chronic rhinosinusitis sinusitis in Africa? Um, there is some uh, research um, uh, being done um, here looking at um, uh, 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 ENT clinic in Uganda, looking at the burden of chronic rhinosinusitis sinusitis and its uh, effect on the quality of life. And they looked at patients, uh, 126 attending an ENT clinic, and they found really that the majority um, had poor quality of life scores compared to patients uh, with, without chronic chronic sinusitis. Um, and there's also various uh, clinical epidemiological studies uh, done in Nigeria, which uh, picked up prevalence of chronic chronic sinusitis of about 8.9%, which is um, higher perhaps uh, to, uh, compared to the, the general population. So there is work being done, but perhaps uh, there is room for more. Um, and as, uh, in our continent, uh, we um, have uh, unique challenges. Um, perhaps uh, there's limits to access uh, to chronic medication, particularly intranasal corticosteroids, and some nasal sprays are costly. Um, is there um, access to endoscopic sinus surgery? Um, and what about uh, delayed presentation? Um, does that uh, have any effect um, on treatment outcomes? We know from the, the studies in Europe that um, the, um, the 
the earlier the intervention, the better the outcome. If you leave um, chronic inflammation untreated and you have chronic tissue remodeling, these patients are um, more difficult to treat and, and essentially are, become refractory. Um, we need more epidemiological data in Africa, and there is a research opportunity on population-specific endotyping and inflammatory pathways. We may differ to Western Europe. Um, and there's also a potential for the development of African integrated care pathways or guidelines. And uh, should we be thinking about um, the extent of index surgery, uh, for example, um, Lothrop or, or DRAF3 in, in patients who um, have asthma and uh, non-steroidal um, in, in intolerance or aspirin intolerance. So in conclusion, um, chronic rhinositis is a complex disease which requires chronic medical therapy. Uh, the focus really is on reducing inflammation. Um, remember that there is no cure and the aim really as, as for the clinician is uh, control and improved quality of life. And the treatments have shown um, in the literature that this is possible. And surgery is an important adjunct uh, to your treatment. Uh, remember, um, the new classification allows you to uh, think broadly, and in, in patients who failed medical and surgical treatment, one needs to essentially revisit the diagnosis and perhaps look at secondary causes, um, you know, uh, for example, vasculitis or, or granulomatous conditions, and um, there are future therapies uh, for new molecular targets. Um, I would advise, uh, you know, the EPOS document is, is rather large, but um, what is useful is this is executive summary, um, including the integrated care uh, pathways. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez. That's, that was an, uh, a comprehensive and excellent presentation. That was fantastic. Uh, maybe before I take questions or comments from the floor, I'll, I will ask. Um, uh, Professor Lupa, if she has uh, any comments. Okay. Thanks, uh, Nick. That was a really great presentation. Just mute. Um, I think we'll take some uh, questions first from the audience to, to see what we should focus on. Good morning. May I, may I ask a question? It's Jos here from Cape Town. Any questions from the audience? Good morning. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Any questions from the audience? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Professor. Good morning, it's Jos from Cape Town. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. It really actually provides a nice, uh, concise overview of uh, many of the pathological conditions that we encounter. Can I just ask you to perhaps recap the subject of allergic fungal sinusitis? In other words, um, how, what is the, the, the nitty gritty of the current concept at the moment? Um, is it accepted as a true disease or is it just that eosinophils are present in the, um, in, with a fungal infection, chronic fungal infection? Uh, thanks uh, for the question. Um, so um, historically, um, it was thought that um, uh, it, the fungus was the direct etiological agent causing um, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, resulting in, in an inflammatory response. Um, but uh, from the work done in the last five years, uh, that has been disproven um, because in a, a large uh, percentage of these patients, in, in actual fact, uh, there's no fungi identified. Um, you can't culture um, any fungus. Um, and so it, it's postulated that um, essentially the presence of fungi uh, might just be a coincidental bystander or perhaps um, something that's breached the barrier um, resulting um, in inflammation. Um, so essentially you get um, a, a, 
type 2 inflammatory response and, and high eosinophil uh, is in the full count. Um, what's uh, furthermore is that uh, treatments based um, looking at, you know, thinking that fun fungus is a primary geological cause, uh, systemic antifungals as well as topical antifungals uh, don't work. Um, and so the, the current um, treatment recommendation really is primary surgical. So that's why I mentioned that those patients are more likely to get primary um, surgery. Um, because one needs to actually remove um, those essentially um, concretions, um, allow for ventilation um, of the cavity, and then treat it postoperatively um, with steroids to reduce the recurrence um, of, of inflammation. I don't know if that answers your question. But, uh, yeah, the, the question is what do we could diagnose uh, these lesions if there is fungus? and uh, there are eosinophils, can we automatically assume it's allergic fungal rhinocytis? Or do we just say, look, it's uh, uh, rhinocytis with eosinophils, presence of, of, let's say, fungal infection? Yeah. Um, so so the, diagnosis, uh, the diagnosis, we still use the, the, the Bent and Kuhn classification. Um, so EPOS, in actual fact, wanted to rename it um, eosinophilic fungal uh, Ryan sinusitis, but because of the popularity of the traditional name, they've kept allergic fungal Ryan sinusitis. And you still use the Ben Kuhn classification. So, um, you know, the, the patients have to have um, essentially um, evidence of eosinophilia. And also, we rely heavily on um, imaging. So, you, you, you need to do a CT scan, which has its characteristic um, essentially. Uh, traits, which is predominantly unilateral, you've got your, your double densities, um, and you might want to use an MRI if you're thinking that there might be intracranial or uh, orbital um, extension. Um, as well as uh, clinically, these patients are usually immunocompetent um, and are younger, and they present with nasal polyps. So really, it's the, it's the, the combination of the clinical as well as radiological uh, findings and the um, adjuncts of your laboratory work, for example, your increase in IgE, and um, there are some sub uh, or minor uh, criteria for your bent and kuhn, you know, culturing fungus um, and, and high uh, tissue eosinophilia. Thank you very much. That's great. So, so Nick, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is the, the, they just kept the terminology of allergic fungal sinusitis because of the popularity, but it's actually got nothing to do with fungus. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nick. I can't see any more questions from the floor. Thank you once more for the fantastic presentation. Um, so let's ask some questions. Maybe we can just ask um, um, Kafui, is Kafui on? And uh, Rauf, maybe in the, in the rest of Africa, what are they doing for patients with um, extensive nasal polyposis for re recurrent disease um, if a lot drop is, is not possible? Hello, bro. Hello. Hi, Kafui. We can hear you. Yes, yeah, so I'm on here. Yes, yeah, so um, down here in Ghana, uh, we are not being burdened so much with the, uh, the aspirin is associated a type of disease. Uh, so far, the whole of this, we have not seen anybody present with. Uh, any condition that requires a laptop or a drop three. What we are rather seeing is a trend towards a lot of uh, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis and then uh, localized fungal disease, uh, usually in the macular sinuses. And uh, we are beginning to investigate this uh, using the cell types and then the, um, uh, we are trying to get in touch with our molecular the colleagues to see whether we can find in the field to try to come down there. But currently, we have not been so much better in the way. Having to do lateral At most, we need to have two, that's lateral. 
So, Gafui, after your experience in South Africa, would you say back in Ghana, you have, do you think there's a lesser incidence of your patients with the uh, SAMTAs or the classic SAMTAs where you have your asthmatics with the polyps and the aspirin sensitivity? Is it a different population, you think? Yes, I think strongly so. Uh, so far, I've not had anybody uh, classically with the SAMTAs. It's, 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 so far, I've not had any anyone like that, and we have a good collaboration with the uh, asthma clinic down here. So they send their patients down to us, and they actively look for the uh, nasal polyps in their patients since they know that that aggravates their control. So they've been actively sending them down here, and the incidence of some tests, I must say, is rather relatively low, very low. That's interesting. Is there anybody else from Africa with the experience that the incidence of sample trial is less? I mean, Rauf, are you on from, from Libya? Rauf, can you hear us? Anybody else from uh, from Africa? Is there a high incidence of symptoms? Because it seems like our incidence quite uh, high here. So it would be interesting to see if not that one perhaps should look at Africa as different to the to the rest of the world for whatever reason. Any specific questions? I mean, my feeling for Nico is a great presentation. Is, is your patient with uh, so with the um, extensive polyposis um, that present to me for the first time now? So uh, your classic chronic sinusitis with polyposis in your Samtis triad. Um, your your surgery is definitely directed to the to the underlying um, kind of uh, patient condition. For those patients, um, we now do a primary Lothrop. Because we know, you know, from experience, that those patients come back every five years or seven years and and uh, needs revision surgery. And in my opinion, it's very very important to try and get a sense of smell back. And the reason, I mean, it's one of our senses. So um, it makes a, with with uh, COVID now we can see how people are impaired just with the loss of sense uh, uh, of smell and taste. So I think it's very important to, to get that back for people, but also for the reason to it's easier to control one's disease. So instead of having that patient come back every three months or six months to do a nasal endoscopy, if, the, if you can regain a patient's sense of smell, um, they can monitor themselves. Um, and uh, specifically after a Lothrop, where you identify your first olfactory fiber and you know you've protected um, uh, the, the olfaction, and you can open that area uh, so the patients can smell again. You can usually always get that back if a patient gives you a history that they've even smelled for a couple of seconds, even if it's on a high dose of steroids. Um, you know, in the past year, then you know they, they, they probably have uh, some olfactory function. And if you can um, get that back, you know, if they lose a sense of smell, say six months after surgery, then they know th themselves they need to increase their topical steroids, whether it's topical washes or their topical sprays, and they might uh, uh, get away with three days of high dose uh, prednisone, at, as you said, a half a milligram or one milligram per kilogram for three days, twice a year. Um, and that way you can really keep uh, a, a nose healthy and prevent uh, further um, surgery. So I think for me, that's one of the biggest reasons I try and let people um, be able to smell again after surgery. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lupa. Perhaps um, there are two more questions from the chat function. The first question, Nick, is um, in each patient, is, the question is from Ovamba Daniel. So he's asking in which patients would look at trying in it as be of benefit, if any. Um, so the uh, Mont the Montelukast um, essentially was um, 
initiated in, in patients who um, could not tolerate um, oral corticosteroids. Um, and they were initially tried out in, in patients um, who had comorbid asthma um, or a non-steroidal um, exacerbated respiratory disease. Um, and essentially, um, the, the level of evidence um, is poor, um, so showing only a very mild benefit. And so the EPOS guidelines uh, does not recommend uh, the use of um, leukotriene antagonists or montelukast. Okay, thank you. And then the second question is um, from Tevoko. He wants to find out uh, what's your take on using false sinus center criteria versus Bent and, and Cohn uh, criteria? Uh, 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 well, uh, um, uh, okay, Paul's science criteria. Um, I haven't really looked at uh, Paul's science uh, criteria. Essentially, uh, I think the uh, European standard really is looking at uh, Bent and Kuhn. Um, I, I don't think it really changes uh, the management um, essentially, but perhaps just looking at various different classification. Okay, thank you. A, a message to Professor Lupa. Dr. Aladat is saying he thinks they have the same incidence of uh, in South Africa, I think of Semtas triad. Is actually doing one uh, in the coming week as a revision case. Um, I think that's all for now. Thank you very much uh, again for the presentation, Nick. That was really comprehensive. And thank you very much to our uh, participants. Uh, just a reminder our next, we will be advised on our WhatsApp chat platform and on our email platform uh, with regards to our uh, next uh, meeting. And uh, another reminder is if you want to present in one of these platforms, you feel free to either email me or one of the UCT uh, registrars so we can uh, give you a slot for, for presentation. And uh, on that note, I will end this uh, today's meeting. Thank you. Thanks.